Well, good evening, folks. So grateful for you joining us. This is an experiment. Um, Chris Crowley, will you raise your hand, Chris, as the interim pastor at Ginter Park Baptist Church? And he reached out to me, Art, I'm the pastor at Williamsburg Baptist Church a few months ago, just with the idea of some sort of collaborative um, spiritual formation class. I had already been cooking around this idea for a Lord's Prayer series since I was the issue editor for um, uh, an issue on the Lord's Prayer through Review and Expositor. And so um, a bunch of scholars, renowned scholars, had sent me articles. And I thought, well, what would it look like to invite them to share the fruits of their research with a little bit broader audience? And so Chris and I have been working on this to put this together. Tonight, we're thrilled to welcome Reverend Dr. David May from Central Baptist Theological Seminary to join us and to kick off this series. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit, I think, about sort of the conflicted relationship that we Baptists have had with the Lord's Prayer over the centuries. And hopefully we'll have some time to share his perspectives and also have some discussion and, and Q&A and so forth. I am curious, can, will you raise your hand if you're from Ginter Park Baptist Church? Awesome. And will you raise your hand if you're from Williamsburg Baptist Church? Awesome. And will you raise your hand if you're from somewhere else entirely? <laughs> <laughs> the gift of Zoom. Thank you for joining us from, you're in Shawnee, Kansas, right, David? That's, that's where Central Seminary is. Central Seminary is located in Shawnee, Kansas. I'm in St. Joseph, Missouri, which is where the Pony Express began and Jesse James ended. No kidding. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. We really are grateful. I'm going to turn things over to you, um, uh, your co-hosts, if you want to screen share or anything, you should be able to do so. And I, uh, I will do that. Yeah, I will wonderful. share a screen. At, first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, I was telling Art earlier, so often we write articles and we do the research and we publish it. And that's the end of it. And this is wonderful that we can talk about it and engage. And I look down to the list of what you have coming up over these next few weeks. It looks, it looks fascinating. So interesting. So yeah, and you're uh, welcome to join us any other week too, if you like. Yeah, now that, I, yeah. now that I have your Zoom room number, I can <laughs> pop in all Drop the time. Drop it anytime you want to. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and share my screen. I have I have prepared a little um, a little PowerPoint to kind of do a couple of things. One, it kind of keeps me kind of keeps me a little bit focused, and also uh, because it's being recorded, you can go back and look at something I may have said, or uh, and and it will be there for you to kind of refresh your refresh your memory. Um, I entitled the article that I was working on, I should say before I get into this, I do want to have time for questions. And in fact, if, uh, uh, if there's something that pops up while I'm in the middle of something, you've got a real question and I have some built in time, uh, just, just stop and, and, and let me know because I'm eager to hear, to hear your all's perspective on the Lord's Prayer, especially the Lord's Prayer in Baptist Bible Land, which is what I entitled my article. And the reason I did that, just a little bit of background, and that is when, when Art asked me to uh, participate in this journal on this particular topic, I, I simply thought to myself, what in the world can I say about the Lord's Supper that has not been said? <laughs> there, there are whole books that volumes that have been written on these five verses. So what could I write that hasn't already been said? And then I thought, aha, I wonder what Baptists have thought about the Lord's Supper. And I thought, well, this would be a good topic for me because I've been a Baptist my whole life. Um, my, uh, I, uh, I, I mean, I played baby Jesus when I was two months old in a Baptist church. I, I don't think there's anything more Baptist than, than that. So I thought, well, I'll look and consider what Baptists have thought. 
about the Lord's Supper. And there's lots of little different angles that we're going to look at tonight to consider how Baptists have thought about the, Lord, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Now, as, as Art mentioned, this is coming out in the review and expositor. And I just want to give a uh, kudos to Art for being the editor of this. It is not an easy job. He, he knows putting together an issue because you assign folks uh, topics and you assign them deadlines and people don't meet their deadlines. <laughs> and someone turns in an article and it needs a little bit of work. And people are very touchy sometimes about what they've written. So Art, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the issue. I think it's going to be a really great issue it, when it comes out. It's still in the in the print stage right now being printed. And yours, your and, article was one of the cleanest that came in. So I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love hearing that. Uh, just, just a word about Review and Expositor, this journal. Uh, this is... Uh, this journal has been around since 1901. That's 121 years. We have outlived uh, Montgomery Wards, Kmart, the Sony Walkman. So I, I'm feeling pretty good about the journal, 121 years, and is published by a consortium of Baptist schools. So, um, just, just a little bit of background about this, this journal and, and uh, those folks that you'll be meeting here these next few weeks. Well, Baptist worship and prayer. Uh, I'm just curious uh, for tonight. Uh, have I'm not sure how to do the survey or how to figure this out, but I'm curious how many of you are in a church today, well, we've got two churches represented. In your churches, do you say the Lord's Prayer in worship? Both. All right. I, I see yep. both, both pastors. Thumbs up. Excellent. Excellent. Now, I'm just curious. Did all of you grow up in a church where you say, would you, you would say the Lord's Prayer or recite it? Somebody did. Yeah, Chris, he's kind of tilting his head. I, I didn't grow up in the church, so I'm not a good example for that question. <laughs> well, you didn't say the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> did you know the Lord's Prayer? I probably could have figured it out <laughs> if I thought really hard about it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, was there, is there anybody tonight when you were growing up, you, you really didn't deal with the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer or recite it or have it in worship? Goodbye tonight. Hmm. I can't see everyone, so I'm not sure. Looks like, yeah, no one responded looks, in the look, negative. Looks really? like everybody here grew up with it. That's, that's really fascinating. And again, it may be, it, it, it's, it may be related some to, to regionalism. Uh, for example, in the Baptist tradition where I grew up in the Midwest, we never said the Lord's Prayer. It was never a part of the worship service. And you, you, just, you just never heard it. And can you imagine what some of the reasons were? It's a creed. We can't have a creed in a Baptist church. Exactly. You, you're just repeating something over and over again. It's, it's a creed. It's... And... It sounds like something the Catholics would do. Did, did, have any of you heard that? That was something in the Midwest. Oh, well, you know, the Catholics do that, but, but we, we don't do that. It so, doesn't, maybe it doesn't allow room for the Holy Spirit, perhaps, in, in some perspective. That is another reason that people shied away from, I think, reciting the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer on a in a liturgical setting, that is because in many Baptist traditions, true prayer is tr prayer that is uh, extemporaneous. Sure. I, I was just going to say that was what I was always taught was prayer was extemporaneous. So you don't, you know, you don't have written prayers. You don't, you know, it has to just come from the spirit in the moment. A absolutely. That's a perfect, that's perfect. 
Uh, it, it comes from the heart. The spirit is leading. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So I, I think that's one reason that sometimes the Lord's Prayer has not been a part of, of, of Baptist worship. Um, are, are there any other reasons you could think that it might, might also have been a bit hesitant to be a part of uh, the part of worship? Hey. Uh, this is kind of related to that, and that is um, one, uh, it's interesting, Baptists, they, they have prayer meetings, uh, prayer experiences, prayer times, prayer chains, but the Lord's Prayer, because it is a form, they hesitate to use it. Again, it kind of goes back to it's, it's a written form, and we want to kind of uh, uh, avoid it. On the other hand, there's some reasons that um, that it can be used or recited in a more public worship. There's some really good reasons. And in fact, if we think about it, let me take you to the next one. There's actually an early Christian writing called the Didache. The Greek word means teaching. It's written about 150 CE or AD 150. This is uh, not long after the time of the New Testament. The Didache is a manual of how Christians are to do certain things in the church, such as baptism, the Lord's Supper, and how to do the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. So as early as 150, there was instructions that this is the way you pray the Lord's Prayer. And if you notice at the bottom here, I've highlighted pray the prayer, pray thus three times a day. So very early in the Christian tradition, the Lord's Prayer was something that was repeated three times during the day. The Lord's Prayer would be, would be said by, by Christians. So it's, it is a very, um, something that's repeated, something that's part of worship. And there's also another aspect, I think, that should bring it into the church context if it's not in our worship today. Um, and you have to convince some Baptists of this, and that is it's very communal nature. Mm. It, it, it's our, us, we. Nine times these personal pronouns are used. So it tells me that it's a it's a corporate nature of this prayer, and it's to be used in a corporate sense. Uh, but it is fascinating if you go back and read what early Baptists will say about the prayer. They were very hesitant, many Baptists, early Baptists, about having it said, recited within the context of worship. One early Christian writer said, you know, it's okay for little children to memorize it, but it's not something that as adults we want to say in worship. Kind of an interesting perspective. Now, I've been talking about the Lord's Prayer, but have you heard it called any other name besides the Lord's Prayer? The Our Father. Our Father. That's great. That it's, that's the great, uh, that's the Roman Catholic term for it. They would call it the the uh, uh, well here let me give you another screen here number five mm. pater noster mm -hmm. this is the latin for our father this is what they would call the prayer now while we know it as the lord's prayer it's also known as the model prayer that's what i was gonna say in fact one of our contributors to that issue who is baptist called it the model prayer several places in their uh, article yeah, well, and just kind of opening it up, can, you can kind of imagine why they would call it the model prayer. This kind of gets to what someone mentioned earlier that we don't, uh, we want to, uh, Baptists often shy away from written prayers, but here's a quote, model of a prayer. You don't pray it specifically, but you pray 
using some of the kind of same ideas about praying for uh, providence, God to help us with what we have and what we need. So it's a model, but it's not to be recited word for word. So mm-hmm. model prayer, it, it, in, in other words, it's a pattern. That's the best way to probably phrase it. It's a pattern for how we create our prayers. So that's a very popular term mm-hmm. uh, for it. It's also referred to as the disciples' prayer, which is kind of interesting because we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually a prayer that disciples are to pray. Those first disciples, but also disciples today, you and I. So lots of people today are moving to calling it the disciples' prayer. I've also seen it referred to as a kingdom prayer because it starts off praying for God's, God's kingdom. So it's when you hear the different terms that are used, you usually get a little bit different emphasis on what the, uh, what the prayer is going to be about or what the person who is writing about it or talking about it is wanting to emphasize. The Pater Noster, our Father, that's just simply the first two words of the prayer itself uh, that has given it its name. So just, just a little bit of background about, uh, about naming of the, of the prayer. One of the things that I thought would be interesting in looking at different angles for the prayer is um, looking at the different translations of the Bible that Baptists have done and how they translated the Lord's Prayer. So... Just out of curiosity, just, yeah, go ahead. Question. Um, so, just out of curiosity, can anyone tell me a translation that was done by a Baptist? Oh, you're going to be so glad you came tonight. <laughs> you I, I could probably name a couple, but only because I read your article. <laughs> That's the only reason. Well, That's cheating. <laughs> well you know it's what got me interested in this is fascinated by it is there are a lot of bible translations that have been done by baptist we don't realize it but there's many of them out there so a couple of things i'm going to do first of all i just want to run through these nine different nine different translations of the bible oh done by Baptist. So here, here, are one, here are the earliest the earliest ones I could find. Now, I'll open it up that if you happen to know another one, let me know because I'm still kind of doing research and collecting information. But these are the, only, these are the ones I could find with people who identify as Baptist and who tr- have translated the Bible. The earliest one I could find is William Winston. And he's from the 1700s, and he, he translated the New Testament, and he called it the primitive New Testament. He was wanting to go back to the early primitive church, and so he, that's what he called his translation. He was a uh, professor at Cambridge. He was a mathematician, uh, a sometimes theologian. And he's the one who translated, as far as I know, the earliest translation that we have. The next earliest I could find is not a person, but a group of folks that came together. The, they're called the American Baptist Union, and they did a translation in 1862, but it was revised in 65, 91, and in 1912. What happened is about 1850, a group of Baptists got together and they said to the Foreign Bible Society, we would love a new translation of the Bible that was, doesn't speak in the King James. We want something that is you know, more contemporary, at least for our, our time. And that went over like a lead balloon with a lot of the Baptists. Can you imagine? that there were some people didn't want, didn't want to give up the King James. Here's, here's in fact what one person wrote 
who was against the proposal to have a new translation of the Bible. This person said, we have learned this, this King James Version at our mother's knee. Ought we to shake the confidence of people? Can you put any stop to the, to the course of the infidel if you thus shake the confidence of the community in the Bible? Whatever differences there may be between various denominations of Christians, while we have the good old King James Bible, there's a broad golden band that unites us all together. That still makes us one family and a house of faith. If we have a new Bible, this band will be sundered. So this was a King James only person. So you can imagine what they did to that translation group that wanted a new translation. They kicked them out. All right. So, so is that 1862 or like 2020? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, deja vu all over again. And of course, they did exactly what Baptists typically do. You get kicked out of this group, they form their own group. They formed the American Baptist Union. And you know, one of the things they wanted to do in this new translation, every time they came to the word bab baptism, they wanted to translate it as immersion. So every it, this is one of the few translations that has been done that translates the Greek word baptizo, baptize, translates it as to immerse. So it's John the Immerser or John the Dipper, John the Plunger, <laughs> whatever term you're wanting to use. So uh, something very special to them. So uh, a fascinating translation. We'll speak to it a little bit later here. Let me run very quickly through some of these other folks. Richard Francis Wyman, he, he has a translation called the New Testament in Modern Speech. Uh, he also was a, a professor, a, a teacher in London, and he had a, a goal in his translation. He said that he wanted to, uh, as he put it, wanted to make it accurate and natural language for the present day. So again, trying to get away from the King James, King James Version. Those were all the earliest. Now, here are some other translations. These are early 20th century. Edgar J. Goodspeed, he was a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, and he did a translation called an American translation. Again, if you would ask what is his goal, it is to make a translation that all folks can understand in everyday English language for the 20th century. Then we have a Baptist Bible by a woman. If you look around, this is one of the most interesting translations. I, I'm not sure of any other woman I know of who had translated the New Testament before Helen Barrett uh, Montgomery. She was the, uh, an educator, social activist. She was the president of the Northern Baptist Convention, the first woman president of any Protestant denomination. And she translated the New Testament in 1923. And then uh, I, I've just thrown this one in. This actually wasn't in my paper uh, because I actually discovered this after doing my research. Uh, A.T. Robertson, who was a professor at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, he started a translation of the New Testament and actually translated the section of Matthew that has the Lord's Prayer, but he died in 1934 of a stroke, so he never did get to complete it, but we do have his partial translation here. Finally, in the late 20th century, uh, or uh, mid 20th century, really, we have Robert Bratcher. He was a uh, translator with the American Bible Society. And he translated uh, the Bible. It was called Good News for Modern Man. And then later the title was revised to today's English version. Came out in 1966. 
Then we have the very culturally oriented translation by the Baptist Clarence Jordan, the cotton patch version of Matthew and John. Wonderful, fascinating uh, to read his translation. Uh, I see some smiles and folks nodding like the, see, you, they're familiar I knew with you it. All knew, yeah, you knew good. Baptist translators. You, yeah. you know some Baptist <laughs> translators. Uh, Clarence died in 1969. Uh, he was actually working on the Gospel of John mm -hmm. when he passed away. He had translated all, uh, all of Matthew. He had translated John from chapter one to chapter eight. Mm. And then in, in the little hut he was using in it for his translation he passed away of a heart attack so john is not completed but we'll come back and look at an example of what he did with the lord's prayer because it's really a very interesting way to to phrase the lord's prayer uh, finally in the uh 21st century barclay newman uh he was known for the contemporary English version, CEV, that came out in 1995. Barclay Newman was also a translator with the American Bible Society. And uh, he also did a very interesting translation called Scripture Start Naked. See, that makes you just want to buy it no matter what. I think that should be our new Pew Bible translation, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> Boy, would that bring the people in. <laughs> He didn't translate all the New Testament. He did large segments of it. And it happens to be uh, that he did do chapter, uh, Matthew chapter six with the Lord's, Lord's prayer. So, uh, so these are, um, you know, these are some of the, uh, some of the translations. And what, what I want us to do is to consider this. First of all, are you, I don't know if you are familiar with Captain SpongeBob and Baptist. First of all, there is no relationship as far as I know between Captain SpongeBob and Baptist. Now, I did look up on the Google and put in Captain SpongeBob and Baptist and only one hit came up. And that was some Baptist who was very upset and did a whole series on, um, Captain SpongeBob as, um, uh, how can I put it? Well, he claimed that there were uh, decadent, sexual, explicit messages in SpongeBob. And so that's the only Baptist I could find anything to do with it. But I put this up here because this is a, uh, this is a little uh, cartoon where you try to find the differences. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to put these different translations up for us. And I want us to see what are the differences that we can hear from what we know of the King James, but also the differences that occur between these translations to see what Baptists have done to make it a little bit different. So let's look at, let me take, first of all, our first examples here. Um, this is the... Uh, this is the Primitive New Testament, 1745, and the American Bible Union version in 1891 and 1912. So, uh, and I got the pictures here. Uh, this is uh, William Winston, and this is Spencer Cone. He was not a translator, but he was one of the advocates for getting this version out. He was very adamant that Baptists needed a new needed a translation. So. With echoes of the King James in your mind, I want you to take just a minute and read through the Primitive New Testament, read through the American Bible Union, and tell me what differences that you can see between these two or any differences that you might sense between that and the King James. Where have the Baptists made some changes? So it's kind of like that little game. Can you see the difference? So offhand, the first one, the, the, you know, the first is that the 1745 is differentiated um, the heavens as a plural, 
you know, it, I imagine it takes it a little bit away from the concept of heaven, capital H, afterlife, um, necessarily. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't, let's see if I can see if I can annotate. See if I can use a little uh, little thing here. Oh yeah, yeah. I can. I can. Looks like I can maybe draw. Um, well, maybe I can. Maybe I can't. Okay. Um, yeah. Look right here. And no plurals down here. And if you think about the King James, if you because I got a feeling that's probably what we recite most of the time in our congregations. Our Father who art in heaven. And here it's the heavens. Yeah, a difference. This, this is following the Greek much closer. It is the heavens. It is plural. The heavens. Okay. Anything? It's it's not the next one, but the one that strikes me uh, is in verse 12. Okay. Uh, the, in the American Bible, that as we also have forgiven our debtors, there's almost this assumption that we've done it. Yes. Is how, how it reads to me, um, as opposed to this being a process still <laughs> in the primitive New Testament or, or what we pray now. Yes, ex exactly. Uh, and... and yeah. Here, the translator, the translator is working to follow uh, a little bit of the Greek tense that is, is used there, but it gives a very different meaning sure. but it gives versus we have we forgive versus we also have forgiven. It's it's presumed that we're already doing and have done it. Yeah. And have done it. Yeah. Anything else you notice? In verse 11, give us the bread necessary for our sustenance versus our daily bread. Yes, look at the difference. Necessary for our, subset, for our substance, sustenance versus daily. So we have one word here and a whole phrase here. And part of the reason yeah, is part of the reason that the word that is used for daily or nece necessary for our sustenance, that word is a very difficult word to know how to translate. It's used one time in the New Testament. It's, it's not used anywhere else really in any other literature in the ancient world. So it's, it's hard to know exactly what it means. And so you're having people kind of grasp at some meanings. Does it mean daily? Does it mean bread that is sustaining and nurturing for us? And but it doesn't have a time quality to it. So you can see that that they are some of the translators are kind of trying to figure out a different way to come up with with what a, that word means. I um. I can't remember any of them off the top of my head other than these two, but I, I preached on that text this past Sunday and sort of went down a wormhole. Apparently there are four or five different major ways that interpreters try to interpret that one yes. unusual Greek word. And it's, I, 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 you could probably look it up on uh, Wikipedia, to be honest. Um, but I will add David too. I'm very disappointed to see in the original Greek, the word art is not actually in there. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Art, you're not in the word of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you guys are much better better at your your Greek scholar than I am. I've always is there any relation between daily bread or what we get translated as daily bread and and translations of the word that uh, it comes from manna that we translate as manna. Old Testament, there's nothing. I've always kind of assumed that in my head, but I've never actually backstopped it or looked it up. There, it's a good question. No, there's nothing in the in the word manna that connects it specifically to this one word that's translated daily here. Not at all. Hmm. The, the the connection that's made with the Exodus account, chapter 16 or 18, 
It's what happens when I stay in the New Testament, and not the Old Testament. Um, in 16 or 18, uh, with the story of the, the manna coming from heaven, <clears throat> often that is thought of as being in the background of this, uh, where each day, of course, their manna is provided. But that would be more a motif or a theme versus anything that's linguistic or grammatically connected to it. Thanks. Uh, at the risk of, oh, of risk of taking two turns in a row, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the switching in the order of heaven and earth from what we're accustomed to. Yes, that's right. Think, think how we, we pray this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. This what the author or what the translator is doing here and here is they're, they're following the order of the words in Greek. So they're trying to stay pretty faithful to word order because this is the way they are done in heaven. So also on earth. Now, oftentimes in, I think when we're talking about Greek and we're talking about word order, uh, in, in the ancient world, they didn't, when they wrote Greek, they didn't have periods, they didn't have underline, they didn't have question marks, they didn't have commas, they didn't have exclamation points. The way that you would put an emphasis is where you might place a word, the beginning of a sentence at the end of the sentence. Um, and there, there may be a reason here, when you put earth last, well, you're be just as your, uh, your will is done in heaven, let it be done here. But I, I kind of like that order versus be done on earth as it is in heaven because this leaves it with our kind of responsibility here. We've got the model, now how do we live that out? So they're really following the Greek order. It's a, it's a very declarative statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about verse 13 also. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, we typically, when you say this on Sunday morning, you'll say, deliver us from evil. Do any of you say, deliver us from the evil one? <laughs> There's too much evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is. Um, is it? I, I did notice one is lead and one is bring also. Uh, yes, yes. This, this becomes a big issue, too, because the question's going to be raised about who's doing the leading, who's doing the bringing. How is God involved in that? Does, and we'll does look, God tempt us? Does God tempt us? Yeah. And you'll see some translations try to soften that when we look here at a couple of other translations. Uh, but we'll end here with the idea of or this, these two translations. The evil could be thought of as more general, delivers from general evil. The evil one would be the devil. It's more personalized. And Baptists here begin to personalize evil as not something that's out there, save us from, deliver us from evil in general. They made it very personal. And I, I think one reason maybe Baptists did that is we often talk about a personal savior and it seems like Bible uh, Baptist translators thought of as a very personal evil in the sense of Satan or the devil. Well, let's look. Let me uh, look at another. We'll look at a couple more examples here. Uh, let's see if I can. Oops. I love that you're able to annotate on that. Yes. Now I've just, the... <laughs> I've just got to be able to get rid of it. <laughs> can, let's see if I can get rid of all these annotations there's the eraser get rid of all of this because i think it carries over to the next page there we go amazing um, it, yeah it's it's it's, it's fun <laughs> well let me one uh, more at the top uh, uh, we're right here that it yeah i think that's got it the uh oops uh this is uh this is the New Testament and modern speech, and you can see I put the games down here for us. Um, I'm going to kind of speed through a couple of these so we can get to some of the really modern translations. Uh, you'll see that 
sometimes they'll capitalize evil. So they even make it seem more personalized here, like a first name, evil one. Um, heaven and earth, same kind of what we found in the previous one. Uh, here's, here's one of the biggest differences. Forgive us our shortcomings as we also have forgiven those who have failed in their duty towards us. That's a very different way to think about. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's like taking the word debtor and expanding it out to what, what does that mean, debtor? So um, you, you'll, you'll see this verse 12, a lot of differences that happen here in some of these other, other examples. Um, okay, here's, let's look at uh, the uh, American translation and the centenary translation by uh, Montgomery and also uh, Goodspeed. Just looking quickly, do, do you see anything here that kind of stands out at you as different from the echo of the King James or something you go, oh, I like that or, huh, wonder why they did that. Well, they, they've separated in, in verse 10 that we want your, your kingdom to be done, which is an interesting way of saying it, but um, on earth as well as in heaven, there's not the yeah. other one sort of as it is in heaven, like it's comparing, it, he wants it to be, what, how it's done in heaven is how we're doing it on earth. And here's sort of, we want it as if it's not being done in heaven. It's, it's like, yeah, like it's not being done know. in either place. <laughs> yeah, but we want it to so be done in both places, so let's places. make sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Isn't that an interesting way to phrase it? Yeah. And I, 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 I love it too because I, I love it too because uh, just sometimes it's just little things, but a little punctuation. <laughs> you know? Oh, really emphasize, emphasize this. This, I will say briefly, is one of the challenges of teaching Greek is, you know, you give a, an exam and expect this is how everyone will translate it. And then you get, you know, 14 or 20 different <laughs> responses, all of which are reasonably correct. Possibilities. Yeah, right. Like we have finally, I think all the rest of them we looked at use the name, well, usually hallowed. Notice how he's, we've gotten away from that. May your name be reverend. Now, I got to tell you, that doesn't quite ro roll off your tongue when you're reciting it as well. But there are some things that I do like the orality of how it sounds. Do not subject us to temptations, but save us from the evil one. That's got a little bit of, to me, that's kind of lyrical. Do not subject us to temptations, but save us from the evil one. Kind of a nice flow to it. I hope you've noticed that all of these Bible translations from Baptist up to this point, they have all omitted this. And even, even this translation puts it in brackets. I think that one of your upcoming sessions deals with textual criticism. Next art. week, yes. Yep. Well, you'll deal with this right here and you'll learn why these translations omit it. They, it's, it's not a part of the, of the biblical text. Let me go ahead and... Get Get some of these done and take you to the oh just briefly this is the A.T. Robertson one we won't I won't spend much time on it uh, he's he follows it is very hard he's a good example where it's very hard to get away from the King James as much as folks want to get out of that that language they have a difficult time doing it because it's so ingrained. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Uh, it's even though he's making a new translation, it has deep echoes of the King James. Now, the, uh, 
the the save us and now rescue us are are, are trying to update the old deliver us though. I, and I I think that's actually a sign of language moving on. I, I do I do like I personally I do like this much better. It's to deliver us, save us, rescue us. It's got a, a very different feel to it. Now, if you want a real different feel, let's look at these. Take a minute, look at these, read through these for a second, and tell me what your, your, your sense of is on these translations. What stands out to you? Well, they say they sound more like how we would speak to each other, but they don't sound very poetic or lyrical. Yeah, it's 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 language that's not King James, but maybe something's kind of lost in the in the process. Uh, look, for example, here. Uh, annotate. Use my annotation again. Uh, Give us today the food we need. <laughs> it's not too lyrical, is it? Now, but it, it captures the idea of what the prayer is about. It's, it's not just bread itself, actually. It's bread and drink and all those kinds of things that foods that sustain us that we need, but it, it doesn't have quite the same feel. I don't feel like honored sounds nearly as special is hallowed be thy name somehow hallowed names is like hallowed ground it sounds more than just honor I, yes. I agree like hallowed means like mark or set aside something as holy honor doesn't in my mind quite get that elevated um that's, that's interesting y'all say that because so, so coming from not growing up into the church hallowed is halloween um, your first, you know, for most kids, their first experience with the word hallowed is Halloween, and it's going to be much more spooky. Um, so, you know, in that regard, it makes hallowed be thy name be a little spookier and a little more ethereal. But um, honored is a, honored has a has a more um, honorable <laughs> uh, reference point yeah. For, than hallowed. Yeah. And we often talk about when you think about honored, we'll say we'll even say this in in court. We'll say your honor. And we'll say we need to honor this person or we're honoring that person. Uh, but when you sanctify or you're holding someone, it does kind of move it up a different notch uh, from the way we, we think when we use the word honor. I appreciate it. Clarence, okay, go ahead, Art. <laughs> I was just going to say, I love the verse 10, your movement spread in the Cotton yeah. Patch version. This, you know, the kingdom sounds a little bit you know, or <laughs> geographically located and um, patriarchal movement does, I think, better capture what Jesus is actually up to, you know, trying to usher in this way of living in the world. And so I love that Jordan uses the word movement for kingdom. So Greek folks, what is that Greek word and how does it lend itself to movement versus kingdom? Well, the 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 word kingdom is basileia so that's that's the word what jordan has done he's tried to use a very culturally some would even question whether it's a, a translation okay. right. or if it's more a what's called a cultural adaptation or cultural retelling is another phrase that's used um but but I, i'm kind of like art i like I like the idea of movement because so often today we we don't live in a kingdom you know we we that's that's foreign to us but movements you can talk about uh, the labor movements you can talk about a movement is something you get drawn into that you want to be a part of and this god movement i think he captured a really interesting term to try and make an equivalence with the Greek word basileia that is typically typically translated as kingdom. And as far as I know, 
this is the first Baptist translation that moves away from and finds another way to translate instead of using the word kingdom. If memory serves, Clarence Jordan was Jordan was also a, he was a poet. You know, we've we've got the stage versions of the Cotton Patch Gospel. Art, were you at BTSR when the last time they did that? Um, so, and, and I, I love the lyrical way he go gives us, grant us sustaining bread each day, forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts who all who cannot pay, and from confusion keep us clear, deliver us from evil's sway. That's that's not accidental. You know, he he he's he's given us rhyme where he can trans. You know, in his translation yes. there, there, there is a little bit of lyricalness here and keep us and from confusion keep us clear um i i don't know it seems, seems like to me this this is a great prayer to, to be offering today <laughs> uh and and i like the idea of deliver us from evil sway it's not just the evil one the devil but evil has lots of different ways to suck us in and pull us in so how do you keep from the various aspects of evil that are out there? So yeah, it's it, it's a it, it's a very different kind of of way of phrasing it. The, but have you noticed though? He left out our Father who art in heaven, the Father of us, O spiritual one. It's very different. His introduction getting rid of the in heaven to the old, to old spiritual. Uh, uh, for me, like in heaven, you know, has a sort of geography about it, you mm -hmm. know, God out there and spiritual one maybe bridges that gap and um, suggests a God who is more present perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. More intimate to us. Mm-hmm. Let's look at one, the last, the last ones, the it looks like Ed and Kathy have been raptured <sighs> in their Zoom window. <laughs> the, these are the last, these are the last, uh, the last ones. Uh, the most recent ones by Barclay Newman. What do you note about here about any differences, similarities to the ones we've had, or any additions that you see here that stand out for you? Protecting us from evil is a whole different scenario. Both of these say protect us from evil. Yes, yes. And so instead of deliver us, save us or rescue us protect us yeah trying to really find an, a different way to update that that language yeah it's different and notice it's from evil no longer the evil one so when i grew up we didn't say debts we always said trespasses mm -hmm. and i haven't seen that in any of these translations but that's how i grew up with trespasses and it wasn't until i was well into my adulthood before we we paid prayed about debts and i remember going to like the methodists or the presbyterians and they always prayed about debts and we didn't pray about debts we prayed about trespasses yes and it, it is interesting that None of these Baptist translators, at least none that I have found in, the, in this group, none of them use that particular mm. English word to translate the Greek word that is frequently translated as debts. Um, we will have a couple of our presentation or our conversations. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more explicitly about, yeah, is it debts or trespasses and how do we sort out what those mean? That's, that's good. And, and, here you can, I mean, here will be a good example of where lots of different people are coming up with different ways to, to try and capture that. If, if we go back a second, I, I let me uh, go back a second. Here's something that uh, Clarence Jordan 
Jordan did that, that I skipped over, but I really liked. And that was, uh, he uses debts, forgive our debts as we forgive the, as we forgive the debts of all who cannot pay. So he expands it a bit, but that makes it to me very tangible. Not just our debtors, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, but the debts of all who cannot pay us. It pulls me into the, uh, the prayer a little bit more mm. and makes me think about that particular person that I'm forgiving a bit more. Uh, you know, forgive a debtor. Okay, forgive someone who cannot pay me. Oh, that makes it a little bit more real to me. <laughs> but if you, look back, if you look back at the one that's from the, um, my, the Good News for Modern Man, which I guess that was about the time I was growing up because I right. remember uh -huh. that um the wrongs and mm -hmm. forgive the wrongs of others that actually explains to me in in my world more what we're talking about people who've done you wrong that's always made it feel like it was about money and I, it was a very long time before i understood that it didn't matter about money it was it was about people who had done you wrong and right. that seemed like mm -hmm. it made it a lot clearer of what you're actually forgiving people. It really has nothing to do with money. And as a, as a kid, I always thought it was, you know, somebody who didn't pay up. Right. And, you know, one of the things uh, I'm sure here in these next few weeks, when the, you start looking at the, this particular word, you're going to see that so often these words have kind of double meanings behind them. It can mean yeah, wrong or wrong action, but it might also mean physical debts. Think of all the people in Jesus's day who were in debt. I mean, we have these people who are day laborers because they've lost their land or in debt. He tells parables about a person who's in debt to another person and you forgive the sin, you forgive the debt or you don't forgive the debt. So that um, there's probably... A, both levels of meaning operating here, uh, and, and even in economic meaning. One of the things maybe to note is um, the difference here said in, in the last petition here, don't test us beyond our strength. It seems to say, you know, God, don't test us beyond our strength. Here, God keep us from being tempted. God seems like he's not as not involved in the temptation business as much in verse 13. You know, keep us from being tempted, you know, help, help me stay away from temptation. But here, God seems a bit more involved in the process of the testing, of the tempting. So it is kind of, kind of interesting how, again, that's a struggle that interpreters will have with how we phrase that. And so Baptists are struggling with that too. Well, let me just, just move to any kind of overarching, because I want to be faithful to our time. It's right up to seven o'clock, but I wanted to make sure that we had, if there are any questions that kind of come to your mind, let me stop sharing so I can see you all so much better. Oh yeah, I can see you all so much better. Uh, any kinds of questions that came to your mind in looking at these various ways that Baptists have, have tried to come to grips with this prayer in their own Baptist translation? What do you like, David? How do you pray the Lord's Prayer? How do I pray it? You know, I... I, I grew, of course, I grew up in the, uh, I grew up with King James. Mm -hmm. So my prayer is the prayer of the King James. So, um, you, you know, for example, Proverbs 6, 6, go into the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Um, you know, that's one that kind of stuck in my mind, but go into the ant, thou sluggard, you know, it's King James. Um, and so I, I pray that it's the King James version. Now, it's interesting of those different translations you, that you saw on screen, there are bits and pieces I like of each one, 
but I do like those that kind of had, they had a reciting kind of poeticness to them, mm -hmm. such as Clarence Jordan's and the way that he phrased things. I, I, and I always liked, I've always liked the, the debts. That's kind of what I've grown up with. And so debts has always been a part of uh, the way I would, I would translate. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think lots of people do understand, while it does have a monetary context to it, everybody understands debts because guess what? We all are in debt in one shape or form. I mean, everybody's paying off something. And what does it mean to have something paid off? Well, gosh, you know, how incredible it is when a debt's forgiven. But I, I, I pray, I pray the traditional prayer, the kind of King James thou. Uh, a, a lot of times though, what I will do is when it gets to our father, in order to try and have a little creative dislocation, uh, I will use Abba, our Abba, mm -hmm. who art in heaven, because Abba is the Aramaic word for father. Uh, and I know that Jesus, the early Christians used a lot of Aramaic words. Amen is Aramaic, Maranatha. Uh, so they're scattered throughout the New Testament. And so is Abba. So I, it's a way to kind of have a little bit of creative dislocation from, from using just the English word father. So when we recite it, sometimes I'll say, our Abba who art in heaven. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna ask David in your in your looking for Baptists, had you come across any you know modern Baptist feminist theologians who who've attempted to to remove the, the father or you know the, to to retranslate in another way? Uh, I I did not I did not find any, uh, which you know I'm kind of surprised, especially in the '60s and the '70s, those translations that were done because <laughs> this is a time of the uh, feminist movement, really strong in the '60s and '70s, and the labor movement. But they all strongly held on to our father in there. And I, I have to say that there is a theological reason, I, I, reason for that. One, uh, in, in the Matthean text, call no one father but God. Really, Paul, the Gospels, they are anti-patriarchal in everything except when it comes to God. Uh, they believe that in, I think, the, um, the context of the early church, the way that you understand each other as brothers and sisters, there is no hierarchy, your kinship. It's sibling relationships. That's how we operate in the church. So in, the, in, in Matthew, you can say, call no one father. Don't, you don't do that in our, uh, uh, in our church. We don't have fathers because there's only one God. Mm -hmm. What are we? Brothers, sisters, kinship. That's the key function for these early Christian community. Mm. Um, That'll throw the early patristics on their head. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but Matthew seems very adamant about that. And, and Paul does too in the way he uses phrases and talks about kinship uh, relationships, sibling relationships that we have among each other. I just had a couple quick comments. One, Baptist spirituality in the 20th century and to the present really strikes me as so individualistic. And so it seems countercultural to pray our father, um, you know, like you showed us the, the plural nature. And so yes. I wonder if that's one of the reasons for tension with Baptists in this prayer, but for me, I love the communal nature of it. The other thing that I really appreciated about it is it does make me think, uh, feel connected to uh, Christians throughout time and places. You know, uh, Christians have been praying this for prayer for 2000 years. And so um, it, it has an ecumenical spirit to me that I love, uh, even as a Baptist. Yeah, ab absolutely. In fact, uh, let, let me use let me show you one last slide that kind of summarizes really well what you said and really well what I think the Lord's Prayer can do for us. It's kind of a good summary maybe for, for our evening. So I'm going to share my slide, one last slide to end, to, end, to end us tonight. This is what I kind of wrote in conclusion for my article. Perhaps in these times of national and global divisions, 
not least among Baptists, the Lord's Prayer might become a touchstone for unity as we pray it together. Of course, unity and reconciliation only happens when the words of the Lord's Prayer are not a sterile script from our lips, but a truth that slips into our soul. Yeah, it, it, when we pray it, there is a unity. As, our, as you were saying, we're praying it with the saints from the past, the saints that will come after us, and there's a unity in that, but it really has to kind of be owned by us as, as it gets into our spirit. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, David. I have a child screaming child. in the background, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, but thought, uh, I know I thought, unity is happening in the unity other room. In the other room. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, part of the goal of this series is to help us to move from simply reciting the prayer to getting it to sink more deeply down here. So David, thank you so much for getting us started thank on you. the right foot. I'm great, so grateful for your work and your contribution and um, certainly grateful for um, the ways in which uh, we continue to partner together as scholars and people of faith and Baptists alike. Next week, we will talk about... Um, the 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 doxology for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever as david alluded to it's not if you open up your nrsv uh or or other translation you will not find that in matthew's version you will if you read the king james version and so the question is why is that there in the king james and not in uh our modern translations and so you'll have to come back next week to to have a little bit of a primer on text criticism and uh, think about what, what that means about how we pray the Lord's Prayer. So thank you, David. Thank you for everyone participating. All right, that was a really good teaser for next week. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to show up next week then. <laughs> well, God bless you all. Thank you. All right, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Blessings. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Thanks, David. <laughs>